that we've been doing. Thank you to the Vice family to uh, for being able to share what uh, what great things are happening in in your household. Um, I also love marshmallows and wish I had a puppy. Uh, so we're just going to continue on, and, and I want to read for us the passage. We're going to be spending some time in, in Matthew uh, and just exploring the the story of Jesus, how he came to be, um, and and why he came. Uh, and we're going to start off at the very beginning, Matthew 1, 1. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Matthew 1, 1. I also think it's actually really helpful if you have a physical Bible in front of you for uh, this morning, because we're going to be reading a lot of names. Um, so we're going to turn to Matthew 1. I'll give you guys a quick second to run and grab your Bibles um, if you want to do that. Um, but we're going to turn to Matthew 1. 1 is the very beginning of the New Testament. Matthew 1, 1, um, I'll quick read this for us or, or try my best um, to read this for us. This is word of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Jesus and Messiah, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judas, the father, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, Boaz, the father of Obed, who was the mother of Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. So that's our first chunk there. King um, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoab, Rehoabam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Isaiah, Isaiah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile of Babylon. So that's our second chunk. After the exile of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shalithatheo, Shalithatheo, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there's 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Will you quick pray with me? Uh, Father God, you have given us your word. You have given us the, the family line, the lineage of how Christ came into this world. The thousands and thousands of years uh, that, that it took, starting with Abraham and, and this promise of a great nation um, to King David with this promise of, of his lineage, um, bringing the one true king in his throne, um, lasting forever, Father. It is so uh, all inspiring and humbling to see what your grand scheme is and, and how we play such a small, insignificant part of that, but still you choose to use us. So as we explore the story of Jesus, as we explore uh, what Matthew is trying to do with this passage, we ask that you may give us that humility, that you may give us um, that but, but also give us that security that you still choose uh, to use us despite of our shortcomings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So once again, um, if this is your first time at MCC, we, we wanna welcome you. We, we love that you're here with us, worshiping with us virtually. Um, and, and if this is your first time or if this is your first time in a very long time, you actually picked the perfect time to join us because we're kicking off our Advent series based on John Krasinski's Some Good News. But, but we took some creative liberty and renamed it to some great news. Uh, and we're going to journey along the first few chapters of Matthew to hear the birth and coming of Jesus, along with plenty of great news that come along 
with it. So uh, as we read this morning, we're going to cover the genealogy of Jesus and, and explore what Matthew's trying to do with this first section uh, of his gospel and, and why he even starts off his gospel with this long list of lame names, right? I feel like there's more enticing ways, there's more exciting things he could have done than to name a bunch of people whose names are hard to pronounce. Um, but but yeah, we're just going to look into that. And, and before we get started, I just want to share something funny that happened this past month uh, regarding <coughs> regarding this passage. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was hanging out with our alpha crew. And um, once the groups had split up, it was, I think it was just me, Kelly, uh, Kate, and John. And, and somehow we, we got onto this topic of the genealogy. Uh, we, we got on the topic of Matthew 1. And I distinctly remember saying that if I ever have trouble sleeping, um, I just turned to Matthew 1 because there's a whole bunch of names. Uh, it's so boring to read and it puts me right to sleep. And, and I was just kind of poking fun and jabbing fun at, at Matthew 1. And literally the next week, um, Pastor Jim, who wasn't even part of that conversation, uh, he emailed me and then we were talking on the phone about what we we're going to preach on for the Advent series. And he says, we should do Matthew 1 and 2, right? Uh, we'll start from the genealogy and go all the way to them coming back from Egypt. So I was like, all right, yeah, sure. Uh, it's coming up quick. We'll just run with that. Um, but in the back of my mind, I was like, there, there's no way, right? There's no way. So I, I, I pulled up the preaching calendar to see which passage I would be responsible for, uh, thinking again, like there's no way this is actually happening. Because, because like different pastors like to preach in different styles, right? Like I, I'm definitely a narrative guy. I, I love telling Bible stories and, and breaking down the significant phrases and words and telling relevant stories and how it all ultimately points to Christ, right? And, and that's kind of really hard to do. It's almost impossible to do with a big list of names, like somebody was somebody's dad and somebody blah, blah, blah. It, it's just not my style. So so I'm scrolling down this, this preaching schedule and it's like, Jim, Jim, Daniel, Jim, Jim, Daniel. Matthew 1, genealogy of Jesus. And, and time and time again, uh, I feel like I'm reminded that God has a great sense of humor uh, and he has a way of very uh, playfully, but also truthfully humbling us from time to time. So I'm going to try to make this as interesting as possible. That Given that it's just a list of names, right? I'm going to try to make this as interesting as possible because, because to my surprise, there's actually a lot of cool things that you can unpack from this long list of names. Right? In fact, if you recall our last year's Advent series, we did one called Knots in the Family Tree, right? Where we focused on the genealogy of Jesus and some of the undesirable men and women that we see in Jesus's, fa Jesus's family line. Uh, in fact, I know pastors who do like an entire series um, on this 17 verses on, on this passage that we're probably gonna spend 20, 25 minutes on this morning. Um, for, for, for just a list of names, there's such a dense and rich history to be discovered if you just spend a little bit of time digging um, like I was forced to do this week. So um, it's super rich, super dense. We're going to just scratch the surface. It, it, like I said, you could probably spend an entire year just unpacking um, the, the richness of, of this passage, but we're just going to scratch the surface this morning. Uh, and to do that, I just want to primarily focus on the first verse that Matthew starts his gospel with. Because I think in this verse and this verse alone, it starts to reveal a lot of Matthew's motivation and purpose behind what he was trying to accomplish here. So I just want to quick turn to that first verse again uh, in Matthew 1 1. It says, This is a genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Yeah. So, so the first word that we need to focus on in this passage is, is that word genealogy, right? It's the Greek word uh, henesis, where, where we get the first book of the Bible, or Genesis, right? The beginning. Um, it means the origin of things. And now Matthew, um, the way he starts his gospel in Matthew 1.1, um, it, it starts with the inclusion of this word, and, and this is significant because Matthew is, is basically committing plagiarism here. He, he's ripping off Genesis 5.1, which reads, this is the account of Adam's family line, right? The word there, family line, is the same word that Matthew uses in, in order to indicate and proclaim that a new Adam has arrived, and this is very important. And we see this theme throughout all the Gospels, where in some way, shape, or form, there, there's a reference to the Old Testament, 
Matthew and Luke do it through a genealogy. Mark does it by quoting a prophecy uh, in Isaiah. John literally starts his gospel the same way Genesis 1 starts, right? In the beginning, right? It's almost like as if they're all pointing back in time um, to, to, to point out a very key moment to validate what they had just witnessed by being disciples of Jesus. And they're pointing back to key moments in the history of the Israelite nation, but more importantly, the timeline of God's creation and God's mission and, and what, and they're saying like, do you see what's happening here? Right? Like God totally called his shots. There's a new Adam that has arrived and he's going to fulfill what the old Adam could not do, which is, which is to defeat sin and temptation forever. Jesus isn't just the next character in a long list of characters that we see throughout the Bible. Jesus is the main character. He is the central focus, right? He's just not another story. He is the story. It all points to him. Everything starting from Genesis all the way to Revelation, it all points to this Messiah that, that the Israelites people had been waiting for for thousands and thousands of years. All, all the prophecies that's in scripture have been fulfilled through Jesus, right? There's like 40 something prophecies uh, in, in the Old Testament about who this Messiah is going to be, right? There's super obvious ones like Genesis 3, like um, the Messiah will be born of a woman. It's like, okay, well, I mean, that's kind of like your only option, right? Um, there, there's impossible prophecies like the Messiah will be born of a virgin in, in Isaiah 7:41. Right. So there's prophecies like that. There's oddly specific prophecies like the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. He'll be born during a massacre of children happening at his birthplace. This Messiah, he'll spend a season in Egypt. He'll be called a Nazarene. He'll speak in parables, will be betrayed. He'll be hated without cause. And then he'll be crucified with criminals on either side of him. The soldiers will give him vinegar to drink, stab him on his side. They'll gamble for his garments. This Messiah will resurrect from the dead and ascend back to heaven and sit, sit at the right hand of God, accomplishing his duty to be the sacrifice for all of the world's sin. And, and, and when you hear that, you, you're saying, Daniel, that's not a prophecy. You're just, you're just giving a spark notes version of what happened in Jesus's life. But no, I'm actually summarizing and I'm quoting Genesis 49. I'm summarizing Hosea 11, Jeremiah 31, Isaiah 11, Psalm 16, 22, 24, 35, 43, 68, 78, Isaiah 53, and Zechariah 12. All of these written hundreds, if not thousands of years before Jesus came on the scene. And Matthew with this one word, a genealogy, right? Henesis. He's essentially saying, holy guacamole, like this is our guy. Like as he's writing it down, as he's living with Jesus, he's realizing that all of the prophecies of the Old Testaments that you see in Hosea, in Jeremiah, in Isaiah, in Psalm, in Zechariah, in Genesis, all of these things were where God called his shots as he's living with Jesus, he's realizing that the Messiah has come, that it's a new beginning, that Jesus is the new Adam here to conquer sin and death for you and me. And friends, I do have to say that that is some very, very great news. I was, I was introduced um, to this article written by, um, by Marvin Rothenthal, right, a Jewish convert to Christianity. And he's sharing how Matthew's genealogy uh, was one of the proofs, one of the foundations that persuaded him that Jesus is Messiah. It is so convincing. There's so much um, rich history in it. And by just the simple word genealogy, Matthew points to everything becoming fulfilled, the new Adam starting once again. So, so if this is convincing to you, right, not, not only from a historical standpoint, but maybe from a faith standpoint where, where deep down in your heart it's almost it's almost as if you knew right, and you've always known that nothing in this world will satisfy that void in your heart that that there is a god and, and there is a need for a savior in this world and in your life um is it's, it's just as simple as asking this christ who who we're waiting on who we're learning about this morning and in this season to come into your heart um and to find new hope for tomorrow 
Okay, so that's just uh, that's a lot to unpack, right? Just that's just one word, uh, that's the fourth word in, in this in this gospel that Matthew writes. Uh, it's definitely the most important word in this verse, arguably um, this passage after the name of Jesus. Um, so so we don't want to just skim over it, but let's just go back to that first verse because there's there's more things that we can we can see here, right? In verse one, it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, uh, the son of David and the son of Abraham, right? It specifically points out two people. Matthew points out two people um, in this genealogy. So um, we want to unpack that a little bit. He, he uh, points out David, right, who is emphasized the most uh, in this passage after Jesus. Uh, Matthew really wants to highlight David in this story. In fact, his name comes up multiple times in the beginning. Uh, his name comes up twice uh, during the, the genealogy and, and again at the end, right? They, uh, Matthew really wants to highlight David. We notice because if you read the genealogy, that second chunk that we talked about, starting with uh, King David all the way down um, to the exile in Babylon, they're all kings, right? Solomon was a king, Rehoboam was a king, Abijah was a king, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joram, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, these are all kings. But Matthew specifically in verses says, Jesse and the father of King David, right? He specifically points out David as a king. Uh, as a way to emphasize him. So he wants to highlight David um, and, and really get that point across that he is a central figure in this. So, so both men, we see son of David and son of Abraham, they're, they're important figures. They have something in common, namely that they both receive covenants from, from God, right? They receive promises from God. And I think it's worth looking uh, into both of them and seeing how Christ played an integral role in fulfilling this promise to his people and, and how uh, Matthew is using that to get his point across. So, so starting with David, it's is, is important to understand uh, Saul, David, Solomon, and all of the other kings that I just mentioned in Israel. They, they were byproducts uh, of their desire, right, um, to be like other nations. Uh, they were called uh, what they're, yeah, they wanted to be like other nations when they were called to lead other nations. Right? Back in back in Samuel, like the, the original plan was for God to be one, their one true king uh, and their one true king alone. But but as we can all imagine, right, this was very difficult for the Israelites. I mean, like if if our country, right, the United States was like, okay, we're gonna do away with our government and just trust in God, right? and, and He's gonna be our one true president going forward. Like that that would never work, right? Um, so, so this, this generation that witnessed God, uh, leading his people out of Egypt with a pillar of fire and, and, and they witnessed God splitting the Red Sea so that they could walk on dry land. And they witnessed God like, like rain down food from the sky. Like these Israelites, they weren't perfect. In fact, given all of the evidence, they were pretty bad. These Israelites had a, had a bit of an easier time trusting in God as their king than the Israelites a couple of generations after that, who, who were oppressed by these big powerhouse nations surrounding them and recognizing the advantages of having a king to lead them into battle and having physical walls protect their cities and having a standing army to again go out and fight and to show this immediate display of power and strength right so so we see in first samuel 8 they, they outright come out and state that they want a king they want an army they want the walls they want all of it they want that display of power and and, and we see God respond, um, he says, and the Lord told him, Lord told Samuel, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not, hey, Jim, can you go back one slide? Uh, it is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, right? The Israelites wanted power and strength that the other nations would immediately recognize. So God, uh, he often does with you and with me, gave them over to, to the desires of their hearts. But, but, but as he gave them over to the desires of their hearts, he also gave them a warning, right? That their kings will use their sons and their daughters, and eventually the nation of Israel, God's people, will cry out back to Yahweh for deliverance. Uh, but we see later on in the passage um, in verse 19, um, but the people refused to, to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. 
And as we read this passage, I think there's a very valuable lesson uh, in us, in this text for us today, as we, as we ask ourselves, like who rules over our lives? Or like what rules over our lives? Is it the desires of God or is it the desires of man? Right? Do we want to live like other nations, other people, or do we want to live more like Christ? Like when we examine this passage, when we examine what the desires of the Israelites were, it turns out like not much has changed since, since these days. And, and the scary news is, friends, that the outcome of our lives, how, we, how fulfilled we are and the joy that we find is largely dependent on the answer to those two questions, right? My desire or God's desire, be like others or be like Christ. This is what the Israelites had to wrestle with. And this is something potentially that me and you will have to wrestle with in our lives. But the good news, but the great news is that no matter what decision we make, we will never hinder God's ultimate plan for his creation. And this is like the amazing thing about God, like that his love and his kindness and his grace prompted him to give his people a warning. Right? The kings will use your sons and daughters and you'll eventually cry back out. You'll go into exile and captivity. But, but, but in that warning, there's also a promise to David. And, and this promise to David is what Matthew is trying to highlight here in his genealogy. We see this promise in 2 Samuel 7, where God promises David that he will establish his kingdom and throne forever, not through an earthly king. We all know how that ended, right? With, with conquest and captivity by neighboring nations like Assyria and Babylonia. No, this kingdom will be secured by a heavenly king. And, and nothing that the Israelites do, nothing that you and I do can mess up this plan that God has ultimately set for his people. And friends, I do have to say that this is some serious, serious, great news. That one singular, very important point that God will not let human sin interfere with his ultimate plan. We've all used the gospel to our benefit. We've all turned inward and built walls and, and, and tried to hoard the grace of God to ourselves. God protect me and hurt those who don't, who don't treat me nicely. And, we, and we've all desired uh, to be more like others and to be like Christ. But, but I just want to read you my favorite passage for this year. This is like the verse of the year for me is something that God's been putting on my heart time and time again in 2020. You've probably heard me preach it in half my sermons I've delivered this year in Genesis 50, where Joseph tells his brothers and God is telling us today that, that what we intend for evil, God takes it and he uses it for good. So, so when, when, when Matthew is declaring Jesus as the son of David, he, he's highlighting the short-sightedness of humanity, but he's also, more importantly, highlighting the provisions and the grace of God that despite our sins, God plans for good in this world, that God plans for good in this world, and it will ultimately prevail. And friends, again, there's some very, very great news, which brings us to our last part of Matthew 1, 1, in this genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. Right? What does it mean to be a son of Abraham? Quick, I, wanna, I want us to turn to Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3. Um, words will be on the screen in front of you. Um, this is this is where we see the promise of God being given to Abraham, just as God promised David that there would be an eternal throne, there would be an eternal kingdom, and there will be a heavenly king that will rule forever. And we see that prophecy fulfilled through Jesus Christ. We see another promise that that God made before David to Abraham. This is one of the uh, first promises that we see in in Genesis, and it says this: He's and God is saying to Abraham, "I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you." I'll make your name great. And, and I love that because after Jesus, uh, that prophecy was fulfilled, right? That promise was fulfilled. Abraham is 
the greatest name after Jesus. We see that in, in Christianity and in, in Judaism and Islam, the three major religions of the world. It all points back to Abraham uh, as, our, as our forefather, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's go praise the Lord. Like every major religion has their rendition of that song. Uh, it, it is truly a, a great name, and we see God's promise fulfilled in that. Uh, I, will, I will bless those who bless you, uh, and I will curse whoever, uh, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you, right? So, so, so as you read this promise God made to Abraham, it, it, it begs one question that we all might wonder, be wondering, like, why on earth did God choose Abraham? Right, some random dude in like the Middle East in, in like ancient Israel times. Uh, it, it certainly wasn't because he had strong moral character. Right? And, and in fact, the Bible tells us like he's almost the opposite, right? He's a coward. He was a liar. Uh, and he was basically an adulterer, right? No, the, the answer, it lies in, in, in verse three right there where it's highlighted and underlined where God says that all people on earth will be blessed through you. Right? And it's important to note that this covenant, covenant that God makes with Abraham, it's a follow-up of a promise in Genesis 3, right after the fall, where God promises that there will be a Savior that will come and redeem mankind from sin and death. This Savior, he's going to crush the head of the serpent. So, so the purpose of Abraham, this random dude in the middle of Mesopotamia, uh, was to establish the genesis, the beginning of what would eventually end with Christ. To, to bring salvation, as verse 3 states, to all people on earth. And God's not playing some sort of divine favoritism here from the very beginning, the plan from the very beginning. It was never about saving a certain ethnicity. Right? If that was the case, verse 3 would read, and all the Israelites on earth will be blessed through you. But no, it says all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Right? Paul writes later in Galatians, and he highlights this again uh, after the ministry of Christ, as he's starting the church. In Galatians 3, a very famous passage, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for all of you are one in Jesus Christ. Right? So Paul is echoing what was said in Genesis, what was lived out in the Gospels and the life of Jesus Christ. So, so when Matthew calls Jesus the son of Abraham, right, he's pointing to the fact that Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise made way back in Genesis. Now, to better understand why Matthew felt the need to, to include this section, right, Jesus, the son of Abraham, it's important to note that the Israelite nation uh, took this very beautiful message, this message of hope and grace to all people. And, and they took that message and they essentially reduced it down to, to God wants blessings for us and, and us alone. This idea of a Messiah became more and more uh, of a Jewish concept. They were looking for a Jewish Messiah, looking to liberate the Jewish people from the oppression that they faced from the Gentiles. And Gentiles is just a fancy word for anybody that's not a Jew. So in short, the, the Messiah was exclusive to the Israelites and the Jewish people alone. So when, when Jesus came on the scene, right, and he starts starts saying things like the first shall be last and the last shall be first, or, or when he's interacting with the Samaritan woman at the well or using a Samaritan man in his pa in his parables, right, or, or when he's defying traditional religious customs of avoiding work on the Sabbath, the Jews, the Israelites looked at Jesus and said, there's no possible way that this guy is the Messiah, right? He doesn't fit our standard of what to expect. He doesn't fit our standard uh, and of what we desire the Messiah to be. See, see, in us, like here today, I, I believe we still have that same hubris the Jews portrayed back then. That we too have a human propensity to put ourselves at the center. 
And it's not about worship. Like we worship kings for sure. Sometimes begrudgingly, sometimes unwillingly. But the biggest king that we worship is ourselves. We we put ourselves at the center. And sometimes we need people like Matthew to to give us that jolt of truth, as he did to the Israelites when he proclaimed Jesus is the Messiah. And they've been all sleeping at the wheel. That they missed him. That not only did they miss him, they crucified him, hung him on a cross, and left him to die. By stating that, that Jesus is the son of Abraham, Matthew is focusing on the outcasts. Well, we see this, the, one of the biggest examples that we see uh, is the five women that are mentioned in the genealogy. Right? Now, now for like me and you, it's not weird that women are included in this genealogy. That's kind of normal, right? Because usually genealogies require roughly 50% men and 50% women. Uh, but, but the readers of Matthew's gospel back then uh, this is very unconventional and a very ill-advised way of, of writing a genealogy because um, in a patriarchal society like they were living in, men had all the power and, and that's all they cared about. Uh, so uh, the point of the genealogy was to show that your family lineage was free of corruption uh, and, and shady people, for lack of a better term, right? It was to show that you had a pure lineage. It, it was meant to show that there was no interracial marriage between Jews and Gentiles. It was, show, it was to show that there was nobody tainted in the family uh, lineage by performing some grave sin and that the, that the family line that you come from is pure. So, so it's kind of mind-blowing to think that, that Matthew included women uh, who, who wouldn't have been well respected in the first place, but these five specific women that we see in, in verses four, five, six, and 16, right? The, these, these five specific women, why is, why is this mind blowing? F number one, four of, four of the five women aren't even Jewish. Right? Rahab and Tamar were Canaanites. Right? R Ruth was a Moabite. Bathsheba was, was potentially a Jew, but she married a Hittite. So legally she was a Hittite, right? Only Mary was a Jewish woman of the five women listed. It, this, is, this is shocking enough to the Jewish readers at the time, uh, but it also turns out that all five women, uh, for, for, for a lack of a better term, was involved in, in like weird sexual scandals. For, for example, Tamar pretended to be a prostitute, so her father-in-law would impregnate her, uh, which she, she succeeded in, and, and her offsprings, this is kind of wild, were actually mentioned in the genealogy. If you turn to verse 3, you see it right there, Paris and Zerah. Right, it's the offsprings of Tamar and Judah. So, so like it's it's beyond me why they haven't created a, a hit soap opera about Genesis 38. Like that, that I, it blows my mind that they haven't done that yet because this this is such a scandalous story. And then after Tamar, we have Rahab. But Rahab didn't pretend to be a prostitute; she just straight up was a legit prostitute in Jericho. Right? We have Ruth, who laid at the feet of Boaz. Uh, use your imagination on that one, or, or, or don't use your imagination. Bathsheba had, had, had a scandal with David, although she was most likely, um, although she most likely didn't have a choice uh, in, in that say. And the most bizarre, weird sexual scandal we see out of the five uh, is apparently non-sexual. Mary gave virgin birth to Jesus, which nobody in her community, including her husband, uh, believed that, that that had actually happened. And, and to make matters worse, Worst, when she was confronted about it, uh, she had the audacity to blame God for what for what had happened. So, so like, we don't even scratch the surface of how odd this genealogy is, right? There, there, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, there's there's absolutely no pattern of righteousness in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes from a bunch of sinners, and I'm not even just talking about the women. Like, you look at the kings, right? The second entire half, those are all kings. Like, at best, except for Hezekiah and, and um, Josiah, the red, they, they all get, like, D pluses, right? You have the really bad ones, like Rehoboam and Abijah, Abjah and Ahaz. Like, they get Fs, just straight-up Fs, terrible people, wicked people named in the genealogy of Jesus. Even, even the good people that we think are righteous, right? Abraham, like I said, coward, liar, adulterer. We have Judah, right? Who's, whose idea it was, 
who wants to sell his brother Joseph into slavery, right? We have David who was uh, uh, like into adultery and murder, right? The two permanent marks on his background check. Solomon, right? Had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which is kind of like, I don't know. I feel like that's a little selfish. And, and he brought in uh, idolatry into the Israelite nation. Right? It's not, it's almost like Matthew's not putting up uh, a genealogy in front of us he's almost putting up a criminal lineup right for us to examine it, it's it's so mind-blowing because when we take into account traditional genealogical records matthew breaks all customs and he does the exact opposite thing highlighting all the wrong people and at first it's it's confusing as to why Matthew does this. But as we wrap up our time together, friends, I just want to leave you with, with the best news possible. Uh, it's, it's, it's confusing to Matthew when he's writing this. It's confusing to me and you because, because during this time when Matthew was alive, he was just steeped with religion, right? They, they, they were like the SEAL Team 6 uh, of, of religion. Like, like Pastor Jim and I know our Bibles. We don't memorize the entire Old Testament. Right? These guys were on a different level, and they had been waiting for thousands and thousands of years for the Messiah to come. And it was only after Matthew spent years of his time with Jesus, walking with him, dining with him, watching him do his miracles, listening to his teachings, being at his crucifixion, seeing him rise again and rise to heaven. After he realized that he was the one true Messiah. That's when he started to realize that the Son of Man came for misfits. The Son of Man came for the marginalized. The Son of Man came for the outcasts. The Son of Man came in a fashion that nobody had expected. And this is great news for you. And this is great news for me because the only reason we are recipients of this promise is because of what Christ did. Right? I think most of us, we're Gentiles, right? We don't have a lot of Jewish people in our community. And my last name is Jew. That's about as Jewish as I, I get. I'm like the fakest Jew ever. We're all Gentiles in this story, right? But when God promised Abraham thousands of years ago that through him, all families were going to be blessed, he had you in mind. He had me in mind. He had your family in mind. So as we think about this time of Advent, of Christ coming, of, about where it all started and what Matthew was trying to do with this genealogy, may we remember that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, to seek and save the marginalized and the poor and the outcast, to seek and save you and me. And friends, that's not simply great news that is the best news possible will you pray with me father god